Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of How They Do That. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, on today's episode, we have Mark Peterman. He is a commercial photographer based in Phoenix, Arizona, and he has a client list a mile long, so we're not just gonna read that to you. Instead, what we're gonna do is join Mark in his studio, and here is our discussion with Mark Peterman. Well, thanks for joining us today, Mark. Um, and again, we have some uh, people, this is in an actual working studio, so there are some of your compatriots out here working and yeah. making a little bit of noise. Yeah. So uh, we'll just excuse those guys. So let's talk about uh, your photography. Mm -hmm. And before we look um, at a lot of the, the images that you make, tell us yeah. a little bit about your background. How long have you been shooting and, and how did you get into this wacky world of, of shooting? Um, let's see, <clears throat> my dad was an amateur photographer, so I had a dark room around the house when I was a kid. So that kind of got me interested in it. I've always had you know film cameras laying around and probably picked those up at, a, at an early age. Um, and then kind of got into it in high school where I was actually printing in the darkroom and stuff like that. Um, from there I went to art school, uh, the Kansas City Art Institute for four years. Um, and my major was actually in graphic design, um, graphic and industrial design with a minor in photography. Um, and then I uh, actually tried to do design work for a little while after school and uh, basically realized I should be doing photography and I enjoyed that a lot more. So as the journey, so yeah. you're one of the rare photographers yeah. that uh, we know that are not self-taught, that actually have a uh, yeah. background in, in school. Yeah. How, how important do you think that is that uh, you have that design background and some of those uh, foundational things to, to fall back on? Um, I think it's great actually the art, probably the art theory and a lot of the different things that go along with the other um, things I learned in school, different disciplines, you know, uh, taking different classes in printmaking and painting and all kinds of things, I think really adds to not being just a normal photographer. I guess I don't see it quite in the same way that other people do. And I, I mean, I did go to school, art school, but I wasn't really traditionally trained as a photographer in art school, so I think that also helps. Um, and the graphic design element where I had some internships and that really helps out um, in a lot of ways, you know, tr um, when you have to design your own print pieces and stuff right. like that, if you're not employing a designer to help do that, it definitely helps out because you have a slightly different eye. Um, and I think it also helps out maybe um, with a lot of editorial work that I shoot, <clears throat> leaving empty space because I like, you know, it seems like the designers and art directors appreciate, you know, dead space to put text in right. and stuff like that. And I like shooting that way anyway. Put an article on your photos yeah. it, or an advertisement. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the color uh, palette that you use, yeah. but before we get there, uh, let's talk about your philosophy of shooting itself. So what kind yeah. of equipment do you use? Uh, are you in the studio, out on location? Uh, how do you find okay. yourself shooting most days? Uh, most of the time on location, I find that a little bit more interesting than in the studio. It seems like to me, the studio actually offers up too many possibilities, and I always like to have something that kind of limits me. Not limited in a very small sense, but you know, you have a location to work with and that limits you. Right where you kind of have to you know, work around those parameters. So um, generally on location I shoot uh, pretty much all the time. And then uh, gear wise I shoot you know, digital 35 millimeter, uh, shoot Nikon cameras, uh, a wide range of lenses, um, lighting equipment. I use kind of a mix of different things. I use um, some Dynalite uh, AC strobes, some Profoto battery strobes, and then kind of a mix of other things that um, appropriate light in the right sort of way that may not really be photo industry standard stuff but some things I've learned from other people along the way. Are those secrets that you can share? Um, yeah, I mean I, I don't think they're necessarily secrets um, you know to uh, to anybody. There are things that I do that are slightly different than other people mm -hmm. um, you know and I, I have started using a lot more available light and uh, continuous light um, you know in the last few years where you know, it's not necessarily HMIs and Kino flows, but it's things that are similar to those. It could be your modeling light from your strobe and you just use it as available light, or right. it could be a $20 um, trouble, yellow trouble light from Home Depot that you use as a Kino flow. It's basically the right. same thing. It just, you know, the difference is price and it doesn't really matter as long as it lights the person. So. And so you have, you know, a lot of your photos, the, the lighting, I've noticed it's mm -hmm. not um, heavy handed. Yeah. And so it's, it's very subtle. It looks very natural. Yeah. Uh, how long, I mean, 
it seems to me it's it's more difficult to 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 light a subject where it looks like you're not lighting a subject yeah. than it is to just overpower it and make yeah. it look very you know yeah. glamoury highlighted mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, how did you learn how to do that with your your lights and and, and walk us through some of that? Thought. Okay, um, it's taken a long time actually um, to really develop that <laughs> as a style where it doesn't look lit, and I think that's just kind of naturally what I like in photography, so other photographers who shoot that way, I kind of gravitated towards that as a style, and it feels like something that, it feels a little bit harder to do than just putting up a lot of lights and, you know, lighting someone, like you're saying, blasting them with strobes. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's more technique to it, I think, and it's, if you can make them look not lit, to me, it's amazing, you know, and I always want people to wonder how you did something, it's funny we're talking about, you know, how I do stuff right. because, you know, I always try to leave an element of mystery with whatever I do. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always interesting to me when I'm talking to great photographers like yourself who light things that, are, that don't look lit. Uh, it just seems that you're never going to get that, uh, that, the award of a great studio lighting <laughs> master yeah. because people can't tell that you actually lit something. Yeah. Is that frustrating to you at all or is it just sort of par for the course? I think it's... It's just the way it is. <clears throat> um, I mean, the best photographers are probably the ones who receive the least recognition. You know, yeah. um, th that doesn't really bother me. I mean, who wants to be famous anyway? <laughs> I mean, yeah, fame's overrated. If I can take great pictures and make money doing it, then you know, if you can pay I'm the mortgage and that, that. that, that kind of stuff. Well, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, so you're in Phoenix, Arizona. Yep. I'm in Phoenix. Yep. I've seen your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And you have these locations yeah. that um, I don't know where they are. Because, <laughs> like, right. how do you find these locations, and how do you find the actually the the, the colors and yeah. the textures? Uh, how do you do that? Well, location-wise, um, I try to scout as much as possible, um, and I think part of it is just keeping an eye out for something that I see as a unique place. Um, you know, I've learned to in the last few years really trust my own judgment on things and really. You know, if I find something interesting, I think other people will find it interesting. It's just not everyone sees it the same way initially. So if I'm going to take a picture at a certain place, you know, uh, say I'm scouting, looking at something, you know, even with, uh, you know, maybe it's a commercial job or an editorial job, and I'm with somebody else, and they, they don't really see what I'm seeing there, um, I kind of have to trust my opinion and not theirs and just say, no, I think this is the right spot. I think this is a better place than, than that, and, you know, hopefully they'll trust you as well. Um, but, yeah, I guess it just comes from, you know, finding unique locations and really planning it out and everything. Right. And um, you have, at this point, you have a nice track record of saying, you can trust me, look at yeah. my portfolio, yeah. I've, I've, I've executed. But in the early days, yeah. was it harder for you to, to get art directors and, and those kind of guys to say, all right, you can shoot at this location? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think part of that was from doing a lot of work on my own, you know, it might be model tests or just, you know, personal projects or whatever. Um, just doing something creative where I trusted what I was doing and then putting it in my portfolio and showing right. other people that they could trust me. And how important do you think that personal work is even oh, now? Huge. It's huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm doing more personal work now than I ever have. So I've got several projects that I'm working on that um, they're not finished yet, but I think it's the core of everything for me because most of the time people don't pay me to do stuff that I really enjoy and that sounds bad because I'm a professional photographer and I love taking pictures so yes they do pay me to take pictures and I love doing that but there are certain projects that when someone else hires you you're never gonna get total creative freedom on right. so you know that um, so you have to do stuff for yourself you know and basically the personal projects that I work on are for me and you know they're a good way to develop what I feel like is an interesting project or something that I see and then I can turn it back around and show other people and you know some of those projects have gotten me you know some work where they're like oh we love what you did here can you right. reproduce that for us I'm like okay that's good because that was a personal project I did for free, so now if you're hiring me to do something based off that, I'm on the right track. So That's awesome. So um, earlier we talked a little bit about your uh, design background. Yeah. You're actually, mm -hmm. I think, uh, fourth or fifth photographer we've interviewed yeah. with a design background. Yeah. I, I find that really interesting. Um, your color palette. Yeah. So when I was looking through your portfolio, okay. you have lots of... Uh, warm colors and browns, specifically mm -hmm. lots of, of browns, yeah. and here we are, lots of browns. <laughs> so is that a, uh, an intentional palette that you're using, yeah. or is it, it just 
uh, seems to happen? I think it seems to happen, but I have consciously tried to develop um, certain color palettes within my own work recently. I definitely like things that are a little bit more muted, and I'm not sure why that is, but um, you know, it's just kind of trying to control different tones and colors and manipulate them a little bit more, and I think I just naturally gravitate towards mm -hmm. that, I think. So when you're uh, on the shoot itself, are you thinking about your the, the color palette you're going to be working with in lighting to that effect, or do you, uh, is it the opposite way? You, you take what you get, and then yeah. when you get back to post-production, you go, hmm, okay, let's go this direction. It's definitely secondary color palette, but I think it's more of a subconscious thing, where I'll see it and, you know, gravitate towards something because it is a certain color palette, but um, I don't usually just shoot and then take it back and try to manipulate it, although I do shoot and try to make it better in post-production. I feel like it's one of, you know, multiple components that I need to make, um, you know, line up to have everything work. It's, you know, lighting, composition, uh, color palette, post-production, all these different things together kind of work. And I think some of the best stuff I've got is, you know, the best shots I have are where all four or five of those things work together to kind of add sure. to make it better than just the one image. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Where can we see uh, your work on the web and your portfolio? Uh, website, markpeterman.com. MarkPeterman.com, yep. spelled just like the Seinfeld. M-A-R-K-P-E-T-E-R-M-A-N. Awesome. So. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining yep. us today. No problem. Thanks. You bet. Well, that was Mark Peterman in his own studio. We had a lot of fun uh, hanging out with Mark. You can see more of Mark's work at his website, markpeterman.com. Well, remember, if you have somebody that you'd like to see on how they do that, you can send your suggestion to me at askmark at adorama.com. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you again next week. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.